really disappointed I had to follow those two guys. Um, I'm afraid this isn't going to be nearly as inspirational um, as you can probably see from my first slide. Um, <laughs> <coughs> I did think long and hard over that. And uh, anyway, I hope you like it. Um, so, a um, little bit about me first. Um, this is me, and I don't have much hair, um, as the sign shows there. Um, my story is basically in two halves. My career has spanned two different things, um, although they're actually the same thing to me. The first half of my life was advertising, and what I did was work for advertising agencies, working on big brands and helping big brands um, to become bigger, to do things better, to be stronger, whatever. And the second half of my career has been doing my own brands, owning my own companies, and doing a little bit of advising other people as well. But uh, let me start with the advertising side. Um, I started in uh, the 1980s when advertising was fantastic fun and it was all about big lunches and it was really, we had some magnificent lunches, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, we really did. I mean, some of them just became dinners and then they just went on from there. But the kind of branding highlights of my, of my career were, were those brands there. Um, and you might think one of them stands out in particular. Um, it's not Thristington Toilet Cubicles, but um, Adidas actually was a brand that I worked on for five years. And I think that's the thing that shaped um, what I did afterwards more than anything else. Um, and basically, Adidas came to us in 1992, and they came with the most wonderful brief we could, you could ever have. Because when you go into advertising, you might be handed, you go to work for an agency, and you might be handed um, Kleenex toilet tissue. That might be your thing that you've got to live with for the next three years, and you've got to work on. Now, uh, that doesn't work for me. I was, happened to work on Adidas. We pitched for Adidas, and they came to us, and they said, we used to own sport. We used to own sport, and then one day, we looked around, and a company called Nike had taken it away from us. And so we went out, um, being a German company and doing things properly, we went out and did some research, and the research said to us that Nike was cool, and we're not cool. And we don't even know what cool means. So um, could you come and help us to work out how to get our position back and how to be able to tackle a business like Nike again? That, it was as simple as that. And we said, well, we're an agency with 50 people. We don't have any agencies around the world. We have no connections around the world. We're just based in Covent Garden. So um, how are we going to do that? And they said, uh, well, that's up to you. You just work it out. We just want to find the right people. And it's so important to us to change our, our brand and to get going again um, that we'll just give it to the people who we think are right and just say, get on with it. So that Adidas shaped my life. Um, Thrissington Toilet Cubicles is only on there um, for, for the simple reason it was the first ever account I got. And you can imagine, I, I, for six weeks I was an accountant in the city and um, it was the worst thing I ever did because I was a terrible accountant, so I left immediately. And I went into advertising and my dad said to me, uh, why are you leaving accountancy to go into a shitty job like advertising? Um, <laughs> So, uh, and I said, because I'm going to work with some of the great brands in the world. It's going to be, I'm going to be advising it, it's going to be incredible. And then literally a week later, I had to phone him and tell him that my first account was Thrisslington Toilet Cubicles. <laughs> so, um, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Anyway, after all of that, um, I then started my own business. So, this is my part of the, the startup thing, startup story. Um, I literally started, I had this idea about English shoes. Everybody has a weird idea, my weird idea. I loved English shoes. I loved the craftsmanship. I loved the story. I loved the heritage. Um, but I thought they were really boring. And the shop that you bought them in was boring, and the packaging was boring, and the, and the style, the designs were boring. Um, so I just had this idea. I was going to go to the shoe factories with my designs, with my packaging, with my brand, and I was going to get them to make shoes for me. And I was going to tell their story, but through my brand, if you like. Um, so I literally just started designing shoes. I'd never done it before, but I literally went to the factory and said, can we put that there, and can we, what if we do that, and what if we change that heel? Um, put together a little collection, and being ultra-naive, instead of going to small stores near where I live, 
I, went, I rang up Barney's in New York because I thought that was the coolest store to be in and flew there and the guy just bought the shoes. He just bought them. I still had a job, so I had to give up my job quickly. Um, and I thought, well, if they'll buy them, then I'm off. I'm off and running. It, it, this sound, I mean, you're looking at me with horrified, thinking this is not a way to start a business, but it was for me because that's the way I operate. So um, anyway... That business is now um, 16 years old. It's still in the same shop in the King's Road. Um, and it's something I love. And it's something I keep incredibly small on purpose, really small, um, because it's something that when I've finished with other things in my life that I'm doing, um, I'll come back to it. Um, and so then Grenson came along. And somebody came along uh, who was the owner of Grenson, very old factory in Northampton, beautiful. That's it there. We're still in that factory now, um, 1866, and the business was about to die. It was on its kind of last legs. It had lost all its relevance. There was no design. There was nothing. Um, and he said to me, oh, I kind of quite like what you're doing. You know, you're doing English shoes without the cobwebs. That kind of, we could maybe have that. So stupidly, being as they were a competitor, I agreed to help him um, turn it around. Uh, I spent four years turning it around, the brand, um, and uh, he, it got to the point where he got bored of it because it wasn't quick enough for him. He was a city guy, actually, and it wasn't quick enough. And it, changing a brand, as, you're, as I'll come on to, is a very, very difficult thing to do, um, and it takes a long time. He got bored, and I managed to buy the business off him. How? I still don't, haven't quite worked out because um, I didn't have much money to spend on it, and, but he managed to do a deal with me, and we worked it out over a period of time. And now it's really taken off. So in the last three years, we've actually tripled our size um, and done it the right way as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's enough about me. Um, my, my topic is branding. So I'm not really here to just talk about my story about Grenson or Tim Little or whatever, um, but to specifically talk about branding. So some of this will get a bit boring. And also, um, some of it, a lot of it, you've got to remember, I... I was kind of taught in the 80s in advertising. So some of it's kind of quite old school, but it's all very simplistic, um, but simple. And I'm just going to give you a few kind of thoughts and guidelines for how to, how to create your own branding and what it's all about. Um, that's my favourite cartoon, by the way. Killer Whale is terrible branding. That's the marketing guy telling his clients. Killer Whale is terrible branding. From now on, people will call you happy, silly fun fish. So, <laughs> Um, so what is branding? Well, um, branding is um, uh, it's what, whatever you want it to be. Um, if you ask 100 marketeers, you'll get 150 different answers. So you basically got to choose your own definition, but I think it's worth having some kind of a definition because it's always worked well. For me, the way I, I like to look back at things that I said once upon a time and say, am I still doing that, just to have some kind of check on reality. Otherwise, I go all over the place, as you've probably realised. Um, for me, it's a simple thought. Um, it's not difficult, not complicated. For me, it's the character of your company in the mind of the consumer. Well, there's two parts to that. The character of your company, that's pretty obvious, but in the mind of the consumer. And I'll come back to, to why that's important. Um, it's not just a logo. Um, a lot of people, it, it, you guys are very intelligent and you'll know this already, but a lot of people think it's a bit of logo and a bit of packaging. I've got my thing, just do a nice job there and, it, and that's my branding done. Um, this is um, a, a company you might love or hate. Um, they did a very good job of creating a brand out of nothing. Um, it's been struggling more recently. Um, but there's their logo on the left and there's their people who work in their store on the right. Um, they... Their CEO, is, uh, the guy who created their brand image, if you like, is quoted as saying, I want my brand to sizzle with sex. So he's literally selling sex. He's selling his product. He's branding his product with the idea of sex or sexiness or whatever you want to do. So, you know, I ask you, which one of those two better conveys sex to you? If it's the one on the left, if it's the moose, then uh, <laughs> you've got a problem. So... Um, it's not just a logo. Um, now, this is an important point to me as well. I've always believed this. Um, a consumer owns your brand. You don't own your brand. Your consumer does. So you can write a million things about what you stand for, what you believe in. You can tell your, 
all, all of your, the people who work for you, you can all believe it, you can all do conference, you can all do all this stuff. But ultimately, the consumer decides what your brand is. And so if you can't get that message across to them, so Grenson was making beautiful shoes, but the consumer thought they were dull and boring and expensive. Um, so it, the consumer owns your brand, and that has some really big implications for branding and the job that you have to do to brand your product. The first one is, or the most important thing, it, it's very difficult to change because human beings love to pigeonhole things. So once your brand is in that person's mind, um, it's very difficult to change it. Um, it's really hard. It's easy to, you're, you're doing startups, so you've got to be very careful that you get it right, I think, get it right to start with. I think instinct is, is everything to me. However, you've got to make sure you don't make silly mistakes at the beginning as well and check yourself. Because once somebody believes something about your brand, they will not change it unless you give them enormous reasons to change it. But it's not impossible to change people's perceptions. Here was just a quick, um, I, I just looked at Apple and looked in 1974 what they were doing. Um, this was their brand image, if you like, that they were putting out. It's a very serious man doing some work at home. And his wife there is doing the washing up, which is very nice. Um, <laughs> jumped to 2010 and she's now on drugs and leaping about <laughs> um, and having a really lovely time. So we all think Apple, we all think we know Apple. Apple's always been that way, but it hasn't. It was a very different brand um, that many years ago. And many brands... So, but it's very difficult. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. So these are just some... Um, now we get into some, just some basics, some maybe some tools that you can use um, to work with going forward. Uh, this is quite old school, this way of doing it, but it just works for me. I can only tell you what I've learned um, from my 80s days and what I've implemented, and it's kind of worked. So the first one I, I do is I write a list of character traits. And I imagine the brand is a person. Now, you've probably all heard that a million times. It doesn't mean it's wrong, though. I, I, I find it much easier to describe a brand or a product or something as a person that I like. Do I, do, somebody I might want to hang out with, it might be, do I, do I like somebody who's funny? Do I like somebody who's serious? Do I want them to be um, clever? Do I want them to be humble? All of those kind of things. And if it helps you, just literally write them down. Write down all the things, and then you can always go back to that and when you're working, putting stories out, doing product, do they fit with those character traits? Um, does the character fit your offer? You know, don't use humour if you're going to start a funeral parlour. You know, it, just make sure it fits. Make sure those things are, and are they attractive? Are they attractive for that particular product, for that particular thing? Are they believable? There's a random picture in there. It was just, I always loved that picture because... From the moment that picture came out, Tony Blair started to lose credibility. One silly picture of him shaking hands with Noel Gallagher, pretending to like music and be cool and down with the kids. That moment changed people's perceptions of him. So make it believable. Whatever you do has to be believable, because they will always work you out. Um, and will you stand out? We all know that one. Um, so just very simply, creating your brand three guidelines, be different, be relevant, be honest. If you kind of remember those things, I think they've kind of helped me, and I always go back to those things. Um, I'm quite a linear person. I have to have things to go back to to check, because I don't really trust myself. So I think, oh, OK, yeah, I wrote that down. That seemed to work before. So um, how we looked at Grenson originally, I got there and I felt I wrote down some of the things that I thought Grenson w was in the mind of our customers. And it was stuffy, it was tired, it was really pompous. They were, they were doing these ads and things about um, how, you know, only for the discerning few and all that kind of stuff, for, you know, have you got enough money to afford them and all that nonsense. Um, expensive and old-fashioned. It was all the wrong things. So we tried to change stuffy into fresh, tired into lively, pompous into down-to-earth, expensive into good value and old-fashioned into relevant. And we check these all the time. You know, we just say, when we're going to do a new... We're doing a pop-up store in Liberty at the moment, and um, it's called the Grenson Lab. And you can go in there, and we've done it right in the middle of the women's shoe floor. They said, would you like to come in and have a table with some shoes on it? We said, well, I'll tell you what, we've got this idea. Um, we won't tell you what it is, but just give us some space. And they said, yeah, OK. 
we turned up with this whole white thing and white tables and everything, branded it the Grenson Lab. It's in there now, and you can go in, and you can go, and we've got 10 styles of shoe, um, loads and loads of different swatches of leathers and colours and soles and things, and you make up your own shoe. In a way, it's like a Nike ID thing, but you make up your own shoe. You can have your own pair of brogues in whatever colour. You can have them in silver, gold, anything you like. So that's about being lively and fresh and, and those kind of things. Down to earth, good value and relevant. Relevant's a really important word. If you're not relevant, it doesn't matter how good you are. If it's not relevant, if people just say, I don't really care. It's brilliant, love what you're doing, but it doesn't really matter to me. I'm not really that bothered. So always, always try and check that you are relevant. Um, so I'll rattle through this because um, I'm running out of time a little bit, but how do we get it into the... So that's, that's what you do, create your brand, um, work out what the character of your brand's going to be, and then how do you get it into the mind of the consumer? And um, again, this is clunky old thinking, but it does work, I promise you. I just wrote this, every time your customer has contact with your product, service, people, building, communication, packaging, and so on, their brain is forming a view about your brand. So they have a view of your brand in their head, and every time they come into contact with your brand, whether they make a phone call to your factory and they talk to somebody and they're either rude or they're really, really nice, whether they buy a product, whether they um, walk into your shop, Whatever it is, even a third party can say to them something about your brand or an experience they had. Every single one either adds to that um, character or takes away. All the time, it's lodged in their brain, your brand, and it's either adding or taking away every single little thing you do. Um, and it's really frustrating because as a brand like Grenson, I've got exactly what I want Grenson to be on paper, and I'm constantly let down by things that we don't quite get right. It's really frustrating. And all you can never get it all right. I get a customer will phone me and say, I went into your shop in Liverpool Street, and the guy was really rude. He was really rude. That's not what I expect from Grenson. I'm really livid. And it, it, I, I just want to cry. Um, but you can't control everything, but you can control it as much as you can and just keep um, battering on, basically. So the first thing is product. Um, I'll explain why there's a random picture of a Rolls Royce there. But I mean, um, some of the brands that I love are just, I love the brand because the brand is so successful at what they try to do. Not necessarily love the company. I'd never drive one of those. I couldn't afford to. But um, I love the fact that they, on the day they first launched their first car, they were regarded as the best quality car in the world. And they probably still are today. So they've never, ever wavered. That's what I like about Rolls-Royce. Um, but the product, ultimately, product, I believe, um, it, it dominates everything else eventually. So all the other things you do all influence that perception of, of, of your brand in people's minds. But ultimately, the product breaks them all down. So if a pair of our shoes, the heel falls off, they could have been following us for four years, five years, if the shit, it, they, they just give up. They just say, I don't care. I don't, and then they get irritated by your lovely box and by all the lovely things you're doing. They just give up and they say, look, uh, ultimately I'm buying a product off you. Um, what you say is obvious, you know, really obvious. That was just weird. I was walking along a street in New York and not looking at anything. And there's this ice cream parlor and they just had this sign in the window. And it dozens of delicious flavours and three shitty ones. I thought, wow, that's amazing. So I went in there, I bought some ice cream, um, I tweeted it to whoever who could be bothered to look at my tweets and told a thousand people, and they told a thousand people, and it was just one tiny little thing. They just said something interesting, I thought was interesting. <laughs> they were right, by the way. I put the one I had was shitty. Um, how you say it, um, how you say it's really important, um, it's really, really important, because this is about a character, and if it's character of a person, how they talk and how they say things, two, two people can say the same thing two different ways, um, and they come out very, very differently. This was something I always loved. Um, I'm afraid there's a Nike man in the room, so he might disagree with me or agree with me or whatever, but I loved that. That was a tag on... Um, uh, the wash care instructions, m m machine wash, cold water, do not bleach, tumble dry, don't look back. 
and just little messages that they put on labels in clothing. There was another one, Have Heroes. Um, and it was like, uh, the only downside to that was that they, they put it in an ad. I wish they hadn't put it, I wish they'd just put it in the, in the clothing yeah. and let people discover it. They shouldn't have put it in an ad, but that, that would ruin the talk, so forget that. <laughs> um, how you say it, how you say it. Th th this again, be, being a very old school ad man, and there are other ad men in the room who will go, oh God, not this old cliche again. But this was the first thing I was taught in advertising, was go away and read a book about uh, Bill Birnbach, and he changed the way people advertised. That they used to advertise with great big pictures and say, big, fantastic, fabulous, wonderful. Um, and he got the brief uh, from Volkswagen in America, and it was uh, 15 years after the war, and American consumerism was taking off. Everything was about big spend money, lots of money, big gas guzzling cars, enormous, everybody wanted cars with an enormous bonnet and an enormous trunk. Um, and they came and said, we've got this funny little car. It doesn't even have a trunk. And it's a really funny shape. It looks really odd. Um, this is just after the war, remember. And here's the clincher. Um, here's the clincher. It's built in a factory that was built by Adolf Hitler. Right? Go away and sell it for us. You've got to make it <laughs> successful. And what they did was they did it by, um, uh, by talking intelligently to people and saying, why is a small car good? What is good about this car? It's good because it's small, because it uses less petrol. You can park it easier. The thing you can't see here, which if you ever get a chance you should try and read, is the copy. The way the copy is written is intelligent, and it appealed to people who um, liked that, being treated as an intelligent person with a view, um, rather than what had always come before, which was blasting information at people. So it, that kind of changed my whole view, and um, it's something we were always taught about in the 1980s. They probably still are. Where you're seen, um, going back to Grenson again, um, this was re really important. Everything's important, obviously, that, um, uh, all these branding issues, because they all count. But where you're seen is absolutely crucial. We sat down at the beginning with Grenson when we were relaunching it, and we sat down with a map of England and we looked at every single town and we researched in every single town what was the best menswear store in that town. The, the one that we liked the best, that we thought was the coolest, if you like. And then we decided we're, we're not going to go into that town unless we can be in that store. And if the second best store wants to buy us, we won't sell to them. We'll just say, no, thanks. We won't be arrogant, but we'll just say, oh, you know, we've got production issues or something. <laughs> and we stuck by it. And it was really difficult because... At the beginning, um, the business was owned by somebody else. So this was my vision, and this was me, and I, it was his money. You know, and I was saying, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to turn away all that turnover there, and we're going to make another loss this year. And he's like, what are you talking about? There's a really nice store in my town. You know, and why, just go in there. It's fine. They want to buy it. I've just spoke to them. It's like, no, it's not. There's another one around the corner that if you're in that one, you will be the brand because they're curating brands in their store, and they're the best brands in there, and we need to be in that one. And it took about four years, probably, before it really started to add together, and suddenly we'd got this network of stores around the world um, of the best stores, and we were, um, it, it's the thing I'm most proud of, that we held out for long enough, and suddenly all the dots joined up. And people would look and say, oh, it's in that store. Oh, I know where Grenson will be. If it's in Newcastle, it'll be in the end. If it's in Brighton, it'll be in Pegs and Son. And it was, we were in the right places. And people make big decisions about brands on where they see them and who they see them next to. Adjacencies is the, is the buzzword. But they make a big decision. They go into a store. I've never heard of Grenson. Oh, but it's in here. It must be good. I'll try it out. So very important. Um, how you present it. Obviously important. Um, I have a, an odd picture there. Mr. Porter, I don't know if you know Mr. Porter, but it's one of our customers. Um, and they've done an uh, amazing job. They sell other people's products. But they've gone from zero to enormous and taken over the luxury menswear market online um, almost overnight. <clears throat> and part of the reason they've done it is packaging. It's packaging and service. But they're selling other people's products. So... And they're doing it in their packaging, and they package it beautifully. And a man comes in a little van with Mr. Porter on the side, and he's got a uniform. And it, you can buy, like, a card holder that costs you 20 quid. And this man will still... It seems a bit ridiculous, but 
And, but it's so beautifully done, and you just think, oh, my God, I love that service. I love the way they've spent so much money, and they've surprised me. I've just bought that shirt, but they've surprised me by adding all this other stuff and making it nice. Service is, um, is something we're terrible at in the UK, and um, it's a very, very, very powerful tool, if you get it right. It's the one thing we haven't got right at Grenson yet. Um, I'm just about to instigate um, a new kind of uh, idea at Grenson that we're going to call Bend Over Backwards. And um, we just need to be much better at really looking after people. People buy service like a product, I think. It's like, especially men in, in our business. Um, so, very, exci very exciting thing. Um, your people are your um, brand in human form. I'm going to rush through now because I'm nearly done. Um, your brand will be judged by its weakest link. This is a really important point. If, if you do one thing wrong, that's what they'll judge you by. So, um, it doesn't matter how many great things you've done, one thing wrong, they'll judge you by that. Your logo and your name barely matter. I, that's a personal view. I don't think Nike's a very good name. Yeah, it's an amazing brand. I don't think Apple's any different from Banana. But um, <laughs> it's what you do that makes that name cool and makes that logo cool. Second to last slide. Um, this, is, this is just for you to think um, about some checklist, if you like. Branding is creating the character of your brand in the mind of the consumer. Be different, honest, relevant. <coughs> and use it in every, every single thing you do. Otherwise, you end up with that other car. I'm very, very quickly, because I'm definitely finished. My favorite brands, they're not my favorite companies. They're brands in terms of what they do. Rolls-Royce, for the simple reason that it's built a brand name purely based on the quality of its product, to the extent that you say, I've got the Rolls-Royce of washing machines. I think that's an amazing thing. Just through the quality of their product, they've managed to create that. Coca-Cola, for the exact opposite reason. They've got a black, sticky, unhealthy, sugary liquid, and they've made it part of the American lifestyle. So, and again, as a branding person, that's an amazing thing to do. Derby County, they're my football team, and they're the strongest brand in my brain by a million miles. One, one guy at the age of seven in the school playground said to me, support Derby County, they're really great. Since then, I have spent an absolute fortune following them, buying stuff, doing it, and they've treated me like a piece of shit. <laughs> they really have. The product is awful, the pack, everything. They treat me like a, like a dog when I go to the stadium. The food's dreadful, they, the tickets are expensive, and I can't give it up. So it's the most powerful brand in the world to me, and I think football clubs are, and there's something to learn from that. So that's it. And a funny picture. Thank you.